This is CNN. Radio. When I was fighting for freedom, I, I did not have grandchildren in mind. I had my grandmother in mind. I wanted her, after having lived all these years, to have at least the final years where she could be treated with dignity and respect. Bernard Lafayette wasn't just fighting for the future. He was fighting for the past. Lafayette was one of the thousands of men and women who rallied together to help pressure the government to pass the 1965 Voting Rights Act. I'm Tommy Andres. Welcome to CNN Radio Newsday. Nearly 50 years after the passage of this groundbreaking civil rights legislation, we hear the stories of two of the men whose names will forever be tied to it in the history books and what it means to have it change. We've seen uh, Martin King, one of the most brilliant men and one of the uh, greatest men of this country. But this society hasn't changed enough to uh, truly accept what he fought for. Only the victims have a right to say that things have changed enough to get rid of it. President Johnson sends to Congress a bill to reinforce the right to vote. With Attorney General Nicholas Katzenbach, The president signs an accompanying letter to the legislators, urging swift passage for the bill that would outlaw discriminatory practices. Then the attorney general briefs the press on the salient features of the bill. It would give his office the power to appoint federal registrars in six southern states where literacy and other voter qualification tests are required. Times have changed. You can hear it in this old news clip about the signing of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And today, the Supreme Court ruled that the change has been big enough to move away from that law. The Voting Rights Act that passed nearly 50 years ago required nine states and several counties where there was a history of racism to get any changes to their voting laws approved by the U.S. government. In short, federal oversight over elections. Now, the Supreme Court didn't strike down the heart of the law. And on paper, federal oversight remains. That's called Section 5. But the court ruled a different section, Section 4, is unconstitutional. That's the section that names the states and counties covered by the law. But CNN legal analyst Jeffrey Tubin says the law is pretty much powerless now. What that means in practice is that the other part of the law, Section 5, which says those states have to be in supervision, that is dormant. That doesn't matter anymore until and unless Congress goes back and comes up with a modern formula. So as Tubin said, it's now up to Congress to figure out whether or not the formula should be rewritten. And today, Wolf Blitzer joined the chorus of CNN analysts who said that probably won't happen. Politically, I think it's unlikely that given the current makeup of the House of Representatives, for example, it's very unlikely they would go ahead and reinstate some of these provisions from the 1965 Voting Rights Act that were struck down. The NAACP wasn't too happy with the ruling, as you might expect. Here's what Sherilyn Eiffel, a lawyer for the group, said after the announcement. This is a critical issue of democracy. This speaks to the very core of American values. This decision by the court today is a game changer and leaves virtually unprotected minority voters in communities all over this country. Now, since it's been kicked back to Congress, the issue will largely be a political one now, one that will likely come to a head right around midterm elections in November. But for the men and women who fought for the Voting Rights Act in the first place, it's much more than politics. In a recent article titled, Veterans of Forgotten Voting War Count the Cost, CNN.com writer John Blake looks at the fight to get the vote. It features people like Bernard Lafayette, who, at 22 years old, was beaten just for registering black voters in the South. Lafayette recounts the moment he decided change was necessary. When I was seven years old, my grandmother and I were boarding the streetcar in Tampa, Florida, and we had to put our money in the front receptacle, dismount from the streetcar, and walk along the tracks to the back door. And this time we were running because we knew that there had been occasions where the the conductor, once we were off the streetcar, they would take off, close the door and take off with our money. So I, as a little boy, seven years old, ran ahead to try to hold the door. And sure enough, uh, my grandmother was running and she fell. 
And I felt like a sword had cut me in half. And so I said to myself, when I get grown, I'm going to do something about this problem. When I was fighting for freedom, I, I did not have grandchildren in mind. I had my grandmother in mind. I wanted her, after having lived all these years, to have at least the final years where she could be treated with dignity and respect. Now, that's a pretty powerful sentiment, uh, fighting not just for the future, but for the past. CNN.com writer John Blake joins me now. Welcome, John. Hi, Tommy. Now, you say for people like Lafayette, the Voting Rights Act was war. Can you explain that sentiment? Yeah. During the Supreme Court oral arguments for the Voting Rights Act earlier this year, Justice Scalia said that the Voting Rights Act was a racial entitlement and implies that it was given to black people that, you know, way back in 1965, a couple people in Congress said, you know, this is wrong. Let's do something about that. It was nothing like that. I say it was like a war because the country was indifferent. No one paid attention. No one cared that blacks didn't have the right to vote. So the small group of activists, interracial group, had to mobilize and go down south and create a movement that would gain the attention of the country. But in doing so, they knew they would be brutalized, they knew they would be attacked, and many were murdered. So that's why I say there, there was a war. Now, another one of those troops that you talk about is C.T. Vivian. Now, he marched in Selma, Alabama with Martin Luther King right. to try and secure the black vote as well. Tell me a little bit about his story. Well, C.T. Vivian provoked one of the most dramatic confrontations in the civil rights movement. It was captured on film. And one of the problems that the voting rights movement had was how do you get the attention of an American public? They don't care. And so what you needed to do, you needed good villains. And in Selma, you had one of the best villains you could get, a guy named Sheriff Jim Clark. Uh, he would beat marchers. He would prod them with cattle prods. So what C.T. Vivian did is he provoked a confrontation with Jim Clark. He led a group of black voters to the courthouse, and he would try to get them to register vote. Clark would not allow him to do that. So Reverend Vivian, being the preacher, planted himself in front of Jim Clark's face, started wagging his finger and preaching to him. And Jim Clark just let loose with this punch and hit uh, Vivian, knocked him down the steps. Uh, Vivian rose up, dizzied, bloody, but he continued to stand in front of Clark's face and said, we want to be registered to vote. And that image was beamed all across the country. And people said, wait a minute. This sheriff is beating a preacher who just wants to vote. And that really helped the Selma movement and the voting rights movement. Now, you spoke to Reverend Vivian. Let me uh, play a bite from that as well. He couldn't deal with the truth. So like the general society, Sheriff Clark tried to beat me. He had punched me uh, with his uh, uh, nightstick and uh, did knock me down. And uh, I got up. That's what we were fighting. That's, that's the nature of what's happened and going to happen. Only the victims have a right to say that things have changed enough to get rid of it. That last sentiment, I think, you know, probably sums up what these gentlemen would feel about today's decision. But I'm curious, you know, what do you think they'd say about the way it was carried out with Section 4 being cut and, and Section 5 being left intact uh, in theory. I think what this, this decision means is that the voting war that Lafayette and Vivian participated again in the early 60s, that they're about to spread through this country again. Because I don't think anyone believes that Congress is going to get together and pass any new Voting Rights Act. So that means it's going to be left up to the states to decide how they're going to structure their voting requirements. And I think you'll see a lot of examples of people proposing things that there will be a lot of resistance to. So I think the war that Lafayette and Vivian fought years ago, the war that they thought they won, has returned. Coming up later in the show, you might trade in your morning grande for a venti after a new change at Starbucks. But first, let's bring in Edgar Tragitz with today's top stories. Hey, Edgar. Hey, Tommy. So President Obama mapped out a major climate change plan today. What did he say? Well, Tommy, the president is taking some big action now. He's doing it without Congress. He unveiled his strategy to cut down pollution from coal-fired power plants. Here's some of what he said. Today I'm setting a new goal. Your federal government will consume 
20 percent of its electricity from renewable sources within the next seven years. We are going to set that goal. We'll also encourage private capital to get off the sidelines and get into these energy-saving investments. And by the end of the next decade, these combined efficiency standards for appliances and federal buildings will reduce carbon pollution by at least 3 billion tons. That's an amount equal to what our entire energy sector emits in nearly half a year. So I know these standards don't sound all that sexy, but think of it this way. That's the equivalent of planting 7.6 billion trees and letting them grow for 10 years, all while doing the dishes. It is a great deal, and we need to be doing it. Now, the biggest news to come out of his speech was that he now says he won't approve the Keystone Pipeline unless the State Department can prove it won't add more carbon emissions to the environment. All right, Edgar, let's get to the big story. Edward Snowden. Now, it sounds like we might finally have a good idea where he is, huh? Well, so as the U.S. government had suspected, Edward Snowden is in Russia, kind of. Russian President Vladimir Putin today confirmed the NSA leaker is inside Moscow's airport. Snowden is still in transit area as a transit passenger. Our special services never worked with Snowden and are not working with him today. That transit area is not technically considered Russian soil. Putin says Snowden is a free man, and the sooner he can figure out where he's going and goes there, all the better. Snowden wants asylum in Ecuador. Right now, that country is deciding whether or not to let him in. Turning to Sanford, Florida, today's proceedings in the George Zimmerman murder trial started this morning with a battle over several calls, calls that Zimmerman made to police in the months before his confrontation with 17-year-old Trayvon Martin. Prosecutors want the tapes included, saying they help establish Zimmerman's state of mind. There's um, two suspicious characters at the gate of my neighborhood. I've never seen them before. Um, I have no idea what they're doing. They're just hanging out, loitering. Mr. Zimmerman, can you describe the two individuals? Uh, two African-American males. But defense attorneys worry those tapes would only confuse the jury. Judge Jebra Nelson must now decide whether to allow those calls into evidence. During testimony, the jury was shown pictures of Trayvon Martin laying on the ground after he was shot. Authorities in northern India believe some 6,000 people are trapped on mountainsides where roads were washed away by extremely heavy rainfall there. In a huge rescue effort, the Indian Air Force is using helicopters to bring people to safety. One of those choppers crashed today, killing eight people on board. Disastrous flooding caused by early monsoon rains has killed about 1,000 people. And finally to, uh, today, Tommy, the sons of celebrity chef Paula Dean are staunchly defending their mother against allegations that she is a racist. In an exclusive interview with Chris Cuomo on CNN's New Day program, Bobby Dean said his mom never used the N-word at home. She has never said those words to me. My, my mother has never taught to me that it was acceptable to say terrible things or use vile language against other people or to use words as a weapon. I've never heard that. In a recent lawsuit deposition, Dean admitting to having used the word long ago that led the Food Network to fire the 66-year-old Smithfield Foods also dropped Dean's ham endorsement deal as well. Thanks, Edgar. For more on any of those stories, log on to CNN.com. Here in the U.S., we're expecting a big decision on gay marriage from the Supreme Court in the next few days. But when that decision comes down, President Obama will likely be in Africa. He and the First Lady kick off a nearly week-long trip to the continent tomorrow. And the issue of homosexuality will no doubt come up while he's there. Because while the United States has been steadily moving toward more acceptance of gay culture, homosexual acts are a crime in 38 of the 53 African nations. And many are passing new legislation to help make those laws even more strict. Amnesty International has now issued a report that says there's been a dangerous increase in attacks, harassment, and discrimination against gays and lesbians in sub-Saharan Africa. And many people blame the religious and political leaders for encouraging the persecution. CNN's Nima El Gabir reports from Nairobi, Kenya, on what it's like to be African and gay. It's the Sunday service at one of the oldest evangelical churches in Kenya. The sermon today exhorts the congregation against violence in their homes and in their hearts. 
But human rights groups believe it's not that message that's hitting home. A major report on homophobia in sub-Saharan Africa by Amnesty International has collated data on what it calls a growing trend towards homophobic violence. Violence, the report says, is incited in part by religious leaders as well as politicians. In a restaurant in downtown Nairobi, Dennis Nzioka and his friend and fellow gay rights activist, Maticia Leonard, agreed to speak to us about their experience of being openly gay and African. As an activist, we've realized that most of the homophobia is being fueled by evangelical uh, leaders, by politicians. And the problem is that they do not understand that when you're there preaching to people against homosexuality or you're feeling homophobia, you don't know what your followers will do to me. Leaving my house, at the back of my mind, I know, um, always watch your back. Lord, would you save them and change them now? The preachers we spoke to say the evangelical churches are not inciting violence. They say they are rejecting the imposition of so-called foreign values. We are aware that the churches in the West are struggling under pressure to conform. There are some things that are actually spiritual matters that should not just be left to legislation and not just legislation should not be pushed down because of aid or physical or financial assistance and that they should leave uh, the African church and the African people to determine their future when it comes to issues like this. Do you not worry that there are those who would take those words and use them for hate acts? We were not saying you can practice violence. We were saying outrightly the tone of the someone was this is wrong. The Bible does say that uh, uh, homosexuality is condemned in the Bible as a, a lifestyle that does not honor God. Homosexuality is illegal in 38 African countries. In four of them, those found guilty of what are called gay crimes face the death penalty. Even the suspicion of homosexuality brings with it an invasive physical exam and the threat of jail, according to the report. If such discrimination continues, activists believe it's not just the homosexual community that will suffer. If Africa does not consider the contribution that men who have sex with men make to maintaining the epidemic at its current rate and they don't have direct programs that target them, then we're actually never going to get rid of the epidemic. Ultimately, though, many gay rights activists believe in spite of the challenges, there is some good news and increased visibility no matter the consequences. I think it's important that I came out and I feel like I'm six years old because I spend um, 20 years of my life hating myself. And that, they say, is their strongest weapon. Ne'mal Bagir, CNN, Nairobi. Two things you may have noticed today while standing in line for your Starbucks coffee. Yes, the price of your favorite drink may have gone up, but that's not the largest number next to it. The coffee giant announced about a 1% price hike on coffee, tea, lattes, and espressos. But that larger number? Those are the calories. Something brand new for most Starbucks menus. The company says it wants to be transparent. And there are some surprises. A caramel macchiato will run you 240 calories, while a white chocolate mocha, that's 400. Jonathan Binder had a chat with someone who's visited Starbucks locations all over the world and says people know what they're drinking. For some people, getting a venti dose of caffeine from Starbucks is as routine as putting on clothes in the morning. It can be that extra boost of energy you need to get to work. Or perhaps on some mornings, Starbucks is needed to recover from the night before that involved the drinking of a different beverage. A good bottle of French champagne and for whatever reason, everyone had a reason not to drink it after we uncorked it. And so I was sort of stuck with this dilemma of do I, like, do I let this go to waste or do I finish it? And I finished it. That's Brian Simon. He's a professor of history at Temple University. And roughly 10 years ago, details are a little fuzzy, as you can imagine, he polished off that bottle at a New Year's party. And the next morning, January 1, he was desperate for coffee. And after stumbling into his Starbucks, two things became clear to Simon. He was very hungover from that fancy champagne, and there was something incredibly interesting about Starbucks. I was really fascinated by the flow of people coming in and out, and 
some of them knew each other. Some of them knew the people behind the counter. I was really intrigued by that they were using Starbucks in the way that people imagined using a corner bar. And from that morning would stem a book that Simon would eventually write called... Everything But the Coffee, Learning About America from Starbucks. But before writing, Simon would have to study the global culture of Starbucks. I spent like 15 hours a week for a year in Starbucks. I've been to about 425, 450 Starbucks in more than a dozen countries. And from his research, Simon doesn't think that adding calories to the menu will have a major impact on how people order. I mean, this information has been out there for a long time. You know, I didn't talk to many people who didn't know what was in the drinks, really. In fact, Simon has come across a certain type of customer that orders very intentionally. What a lot of people do at Starbucks is something I call, and and other people call, self-gifting. And they're really very kind of clear about this. They'll say, look, my, um, I took an exam today. I mean, students will say, and I treated myself with, you know, a grande frappuccino. So that 440 calorie caramel ribbon crunch frappuccino is an intentional indulgent. It's a gift. Okay, but not everyone is going to Starbucks for these desserts in a glass. For some, coffee is closer to a bodily requirement than a treat. Some people are going for the fuel. They're going for caffeine, right? Right. So how will the posted calories change those who blindly order lattes for the caffeine fix? What I think will happen is some people will be more aware of what's in their drinks, and they're going to go for you know, a skinny latte. But other days, they're going to want all that full-fat drink. You know, the number of choices has always been one of Starbucks' strengths, right? The ability to customize drinks. This is what Starbucks customers like. We're over 170,000 combinations for beverages offered in our stores. That's Lisa Passe. I oversee global brand PR here at Starbucks Coffee Company. And so from Starbucks' standpoint, if people are shocked to find out how many calories are in their morning routine, then this is a great opportunity to do something about it. I think people are going to ask those questions of saying, Oh, I didn't, I didn't realize I could have it with, with a mocha without whip. Or I didn't realize I could um, make this a little bit lighter. And Simon and Passe both agree that may happen more frequently as a result of posting calories. But Passe says customers have already been looking to cut calories in their order. And so that's the, the conversation happening between the barista and the customer right now as they order their individual beverage. So I do believe that it will inspire further conversation just about those individual choices. Now, luckily for Passe, calories aren't too big of an issue for her morning cup of coffee. I do take it black, and you should always taste your coffee black first and uh, you know, to bring out really some of those uh, wonderful sensory uh, experiences on your tongue. And then you can add cream and sugar, of course, if you, if you would prefer. As for Simon, he's had to take a break from going to Starbucks. Who can blame him? But he is still a coffee drinker. I am. I have a cup of coffee in front of me right now. I, I grind beans. That's the only thing I do. I grind the beans and I make um, just in a drip coffee maker. So whether it's a fancy drink from Starbucks or a fancy bottle of French champagne, I think the lesson here is make sure you know what you're drinking so you don't regret it the next day. Jonathan Binder, CNN. Well, that's our show today. We try not to bring you too much bad news around here, but today we have a little, at least if you're a fan of the show. This is our last broadcast. We found out just minutes before we recorded that CNN Radio a brand that in some incarnation has been around for over 30 years, will now jump into the media history books. You've listened at least this once, and that means the world to us. The members of our small staff wanted to sign out one more time from all across the country. I'm Steve Kastenbaum in New York. I'm Lisa Desjardins at the Capitol. I'm Novosafo in Chicago. I'm Dan Simatovich in Washington. I'm Jim Roop in Los Angeles. I'm Pat St. Clair, CNN Radio. For Libby Lewis in Washington and all the folks here in Atlanta, that's Barbara Hall, Gavin Godfrey, Jenny Ament, Chip Grabo, Emma Lacey Bordeaux, Jonathan Bender, Edgar Tragetz, Susanna Capaluto, and our boss, Tyler Moody. I'm Tommy Andres, signing off.